Romans 8, verse 36 through 39. Just as it is written, for your sake, we are being put to death all day long. We were considered as sheep to be slaughtered. But in all these things, we overwhelmingly conquer through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death, nor love, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Let's stand and sing Blessed Assurance, Jesus is Mine. Thank you. 
is so sweet to trust in Jesus. <laughs> So Peyton and Lily are going to um, sing in her place, and they're going to be doing Hosanna. Thank you. 
let's, let's look at chapter 13 because this, this chapter it's, one of the, it's really one of the easiest chapters in all the Bible to understand. But it's so difficult to live it out. But let's just look at what, what Paul says here, writing under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. He says, But earnestly desire the greater spiritual gifts, and I show you a still more excellent way. If I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, but do not have love, I become a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and know all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains, but do not have love, I'm nothing. And if I give all my possessions to feed the poor, and if I surrender my body to be burned, but do not have love, it profits me nothing. Love is patient, love is kind, and is not jealous. Love does not brag and is not arrogant. It does not act unbecomingly. It does not seek its own. It is not provoked. It does not take into account a wrong suffered. It does not rejoice in unrighteousness, but rejoices with the truth. It bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Heavenly Father, we ask Your blessing upon the reading and the teaching of Your Word this morning. We ask that Your Holy Spirit would move in our midst. Lord, that You would draw people to You, draw Christians closer to You, revive our hearts. Lord, if there's one here today who doesn't know You and know the love of Christ, may today be the day that they experience salvation. We'll give You the glory for it all. In Jesus' name, Amen. Have you ever been somewhere you you felt just sort of out of place, something wasn't right? Uh, I, you know, Marty and I took Sarah and Elena to a concert one time in Miami. It was this girl band from Korea, and there and so I decided to go in. And, you know, there was all these teenage girls running around shouting stuff, and then I walked six foot tall, white haired man. I was out of place as a ham sandwich at a Jewish picnic. <laughs> I mean, I just felt awkward. Yeah. And in the Corinthian church, they were bragging about all their spiritual gifts, all the, you know, they were really proud and puffed up and just being arrogant about their spiritual giftedness. But Paul puts his finger on, there's just something that's out of place in what Amen. you're doing there. Amen. It, it, it's lacking love. And, and if it's not in that atmosphere of love, all your spiritual gifts are, are useless. They're worthless. They don't amount to anything. And so he comes to uh, chapter 13. You're going to have to bear with me. My allergies are making my eyes water today. This page is blurry. Um, why is it that he talks about spiritual gifts in chapter 12 and spiritual gifts in chapter 14. And right in the middle is this chapter on love. It's not that he just went off chasing a rabbit, right? Like we preachers tend to do. He, he wanted to make sure that they knew that spiritual gifts have to be used in a context of love. You, you have a spiritual gift that God wants you to use in the church, but if you don't use it in love, it's useless. That's right. I guess we ought to define what love is. Do you think that would be a good thing before we get started? You know, love, it, it, it's based on the love of God. We talk about the New Testament word agape. And we try to give it all this stuff. The thing is, in Paul's day, agape was just sort of a generic word for love. It really didn't carry all the meaning that it, that it has for us. And I think that's why the biblical writers took that word and gave it the meaning that, it, that we know today. It, it was actually not the Greek that gave it its meaning. It was the biblical writers that gave yeah, that meaning, gave that term the meaning that we have today. And, and I like what Leon Morris said about it. It's that this love of God is a love for the utterly unworthy. It's a love which proceeds from a God who is Himself love 
It is a love lavished on others without thought of whether they are worthy to receive it or not. It proceeds rather from the nature of the lover than from any merit in the beloved. In other words, this, this love is based on God's character. It's not based on how lovely we are. Okay? It's because God is love and that's just what He does. And we as Christians, that's the love that ought to characterize our lives if, if we've been given a new heart by the Holy Spirit. And I think one of the things that Paul is getting at here is that uh, uh, the main thing in this chapter is that the fundamental indication of spiritual maturity is not gifts, not spiritual gifts, but love. If you want to know if you're a mature Christian, look at how you love. So, this week we're going to look at the priority of love and the pathway of love. And, and next week, we'll look at the permanence of love. But let's look at the priority of love. Basically, what he says in verse 1 is that without love, what you say is unpleasant. If I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, but do not have love, I have become a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. You know, on the way back from Kentucky this week, Friday, I, I stopped in Valdosta to get gas. And when I plugged my GPS back in with my phone, it's, you know, the directions on the screen were perfectly fine. But it just started blurting out all these random commands. Turn right in 200 feet. Take the second turn at, at the roundabout. There's no roundabout on I-75, by the way. Yeah. It just one thing after another. You've arrived at your destination. Well, I still had several hours to go. It was quite annoying. I muted it for a little while because it, I figured what it had to say wasn't very important. I could just go by what's on the screen. But you know, how often are we as Christians like that? Yeah. We want to shout down the truth, tell, you know, we don't care if we offend people. We say the truth, but we say it in an ugly way. And, and what do people do? They shut us off. Yeah. Don't they? They don't care what you have to say. Because you're just just a bunch of noise to them. It's, it's offensive. If you want to get your point across, you've got to get it across in love. It, yeah. Paul's using a, a ridiculous example here. If I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, but don't have love, he's using hyperbole. He's not making a case that angels have a language that we don't know about. And if you have this ultra-giftedness, you can speak in the tongues of angels. What he's saying is, man, it, it doesn't matter if I could stand around and talk as eloquently as an angel could talk. If I don't have love, I'm just a, a noisy gong. It's an unpleasant sound. That's right. So how about it? Does that define your life? Verse 2, without love... What you know is unimportant. If I have the gift of prophecy and know all mysteries and all knowledge, if I have all faith so as to remove mountains but don't have love, I have nothing. He's, he's really pouring it on thick here with the hyperbole. He's basically saying if you had the same knowledge that God has, if I know all things, well, who, who knows all things? God, right? If I know all things but I don't have love, I'm nothing. Think about that for a minute. I mean, just because you have the gift of prophecy, I mean, think, do you know somebody in the Old Testament who had the gift of prophecy, but it didn't do him any good? What about Balaam? Yeah. Didn't he know God's will? Know what God wanted him to say? But what did he do? He, he tried to deceive God's people and lead them astray. He didn't love God's people. Right. You, you contrast that with somebody like Jeremiah who, who wept over the condition of God's people. He was a true prophet because he prophesied in love. He cared about God's people. And people, you've heard the old saying, people don't 
care how much you know until they know how much you care. Amen. That's, that's what Paul is getting at here. I don't care if you have all the theological and doctrinal knowledge in the world. If you don't love people, it's not really that important. And then in verse 3, without love, what you do is unprofitable. Now imagine this. He says, if I give my possessions to feed the poor, and if I surrender my body to be burned, but do not have love, it profits me nothing. Do you, do you remember way back in chapter 3 when we were going through there and he talked about building on the foundation of Jesus with wood, hay, and straw, with gold, silver, and precious stones. And, 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 and it was verse 12 through 15 of chapter 3 if you, ever want, if you want to look that up. But he said your, your works are going to be tried with fire. And if anything remains, you'll get a reward. But if, but if nothing remains, you're going to suffer loss, but you'll still be saved, yet so as by fire. Now he imagines a situation here where somebody gives all their possessions to feed the poor, and they come to this judgment seat, and their works are tried by fire, and they don't have anything left to show for it. Can you imagine that? Giving everything you have to the poor, and it being useless, being totally useless. How in the world could that happen? Well, maybe I do it for selfish motives. Maybe I do it to make myself look good. Maybe I do it because I read that story of the rich young ruler and for some reason I think, well, that's the only way I can get to heaven is if I give everything away. And, you know, that was just for that one man. You know, if, if, but the only way that would get you anything on Judgment Day is if you do that in love. He even says you could, you could give your body to be martyred, to be burned. And if you don't do it in love, it's not going to profit you anything. How are, we going to, how, how are you doing on, on, on Judgment Day? Are your motives good? You know? Well, now we come to this long list in verses 4 through 7. There's 14 of these items here that describe love these characteristics that are listed here, they're sort of like boundaries. And if you cross these boundaries, you know you've gone astray from love. Okay? So think about that. But something that, that we miss in English is that all of these characteristics in, in Greek are given as verbs. Which means that love is something we do. Okay? It's an action. And it's in a continuous tense also, which means that it, it's something, these are things that we do or don't do that characterize our life. It's the direction of our life. I don't know, several commentators have pointed out that if you go down this list, you can substitute the name of Jesus for the word love and you see what Jesus is like. So like love is patient, you could say Jesus is patient. Right? Amen. Because Jesus is patient with us, right? Well, before we go through this list, let me ask you something. What is the goal of Christian maturity? Who are we supposed to be like? Jesus. Jesus. So if you want a spiritual checkup this morning, as we go down this list, can you substitute your name for love in each of these points? Is Tim patient? Is Tim kind? There's a good spiritual checkup, right? Yeah. And don't use it on other people. It's just for you, okay? All right, so let's look at, at, at this first one. He says love, love is patient in verse 4. Now what that means, love has a long fuse. Chrysostom, the early church father, he, he said it's used of a man who is wronged and who is easily the power to avenge himself, but he doesn't do it. We, we see the example of Jesus. 1 Peter 2.23 says, And while being reviled, he did not revile in return. While suffering, he, he uttered no threats, but kept entrusting himself to the one who judges righteously. Jesus on the cross between two thieves hurling insults at him. The soldiers mocking him. And, and, and what does the Bible say? At any point he could have called down a whole legion of angels 
to deliver him from that cross, but what did he do? He entrusted himself to God. Didn't need to seek revenge. Didn't need to become angry because he entrusted that, that everything was under God's control and God would take care of it. So let me ask you something. Are you patient? Love is kind. In verse 4, love reacts with goodness toward those who are unkind to you. It's not just being kind to people that are kind to you. You've got to be kind to people that are unkind to you. All this, I treat you like you treat me, that's not a Christian attitude. Amen. Is Jesus kind? Romans 2.4 Or do you think lightly of the riches of His kindness and tolerance and patience, not knowing that the kindness of God leads you to repentance? Is, he, is Jesus kind with you? Is He patient with you? Does He put up with you? When you mess up, that's how we have to treat our brothers and sisters. Love is not jealous. In verse 4. You can test this one on yourself by how you react when somebody else gets good news. When somebody else gets the promotion that you wanted, when somebody else gets the new car, when somebody else gets the new house. You know, are you genuinely happy for that person or are you jealous? That's, that's what this is all about. Love does not brag. The loving person who is successful doesn't seek a platform from which to parade his or her accomplishments. You know, while my granddaughter was here, I kind of got acquainted with Peppa Pig. And uh, there's this character on Peppa named Edmund Elephant. And if, if you know, the, you know, Peppa is a British show. It, it, and the, the terminology for somebody in the sort of the slang terminology in Britain for somebody who is smart in an annoying way, they call them a clever clogs. And Edmund is a clever clogs. And he admits it. He, he says, I'm a clever clogs. And uh, that's basically what Paul is talking about here is somebody who, who's always bragging, somebody who's, who's smart in an annoying way. Somebody who, who's always bragging on their accomplishments and what they do. And so you don't want to be like that and be to be like Jesus. Love is not arrogant in verse 4. The, the word means puffed up or full of yourself. Learn, here's the thing. Love is concerned to give itself, not assert itself. Are you arrogant? Well, no, I'm not arrogant. Well, maybe, maybe you're not. Maybe, but maybe you, you are sometimes and you don't realize it. That was a hard one. I, I, I will say that I think that this is the one that makes the prosperity gospel so popular. Is because the prosperity gospel preacher on TV is going to appeal to your arrogance. They're going to say, you know, this is my Bible. I am what it says I am. I have what it says I have. I can do what it says I can do. Yeah. And then they won't tell you what the Bible actually says you are because the Bible says that there's not one who seeks after God and there's Amen. none righteous. Amen. No, not one. And they won't tell you that. They'll tell you all this stuff, you know, to make you feel good about yourself. Yes, sir. To stoke your pride. Love is not rude. Verse 5, it, it says does not act unbecomingly, but the, the simple translation is just, it's not rude. Love has good manners. Doesn't, you know, put people down. It's concerned about the welfare of others. It's not rude. It's not self-seeking. Verse 5, it does not seek its own. Paul said it in Philippians chapter 2, verses 3 and 4, Do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit, but with humility of mind, regard one another as more important than yourselves. Do not merely look out for your own personal interests, but also 
the interests of others. Do you always seek your benefit or the benefit of others? I, you know, this one hits me when I'm driving. Yeah. Yeah. yeah right? Yes, sir. I think it hits everybody around here. Amen. Right? It's, do you let people get over if they, you know, their, their lane is about to run out? You know? Do you make a little room for them to get in or are you just thinking about how fast you can get somewhere? Just thinking about yourself. Uh -huh. Right? Yes, sir. Well, if you're that way with driving in a little thing, imagine what you'd be like in a big thing. Right? Don't seek your own. Seek the, the welfare of others. All right. Love is not irritable. Verse 5. It says it's not provoked, but I, I think I like the word irritable. The, the, the word there refers to sudden outbursts of anger. Uh, instead of loving people despite all their faults, many of us tend to focus on what annoys us about certain people. Uh, now, there is a place for righteous anger. Remember, Jesus threw the money changers out of the temple, but it, but it wasn't because they were insulting Him it was because they were profaning God in His temple, and that was a righteous, that was a good reason to be angry. Amen. People who were claiming to be the religious leaders were making a mockery of God's house. But do you are you irritable? Well, that's a that's a good sign you're not walking in love. Love keeps no record of wrongs. His love does, does not take into account a wrong suffered. You ever get into an argument with somebody and all of a sudden they don't get hysterical, they get historical. Bring up things you've done in the past. That's not love. Love puts those things where they belong in the past and Amen. leaves them there. Amen. I mean, think, does, does God keep a record of our wrongs when we've been forgiven? Romans 4, 7, and 8, Blessed are those whose lawless deeds have been forgiven and whose sins have been covered. Blessed is the man whose sins the Lord will not take into account. God does, they're, they're gone from your account. Love does not delight in evil, verse 6. Does not rejoice in unrighteousness. You know, I, I, I might meddle here a little bit, but this one is the one, is the reason why I don't watch cable news. When's the last time you watched Fox News or CNN or one of those news channels and they told you something good about somebody? Yeah, that's right, brother. Right? They, they, they rejoice, they delight in pointing out the evil things that people are doing. And folks, you will get discipled by that if you watch that all the time. Amen. Where you spend most of your time is what is going to disciple your heart. That's right. And they know that, that fear and anger gets viewers. And you'll get discipled with fear and anger. Does not delight in evil. Love rejoices in truth. Isn't that funny in verse 6 that he set up as opposites? Does not rejoice in unrighteousness, but rejoices in truth. What in the world, how, how is truth the opposite of unrighteousness? Well, you can't separate truth, you can't separate love from truth and morality. Truth is a moral thing, not just a, an objective thing about propositions. There's a moral aspect to truth. And, and, and that is why after you are married, you can't fall in love with someone else other than your spouse. That, that isn't love. That's lust. Truth is connected with righteousness and love. Love bears all things. Verse 7. It's, it, the, the word here means to cover like a roof. It doesn't, it doesn't mean 
that you just sweep things under the rug. The, the idea behind this is the mercy seat in the Old Testament. It's not that sin is, is covered up and not dealt with. It's that you, you deal with it and, and, and you deal with it in a way that gets rid of it and takes care of it. It covers it up. That, that protects. It, it, it bears all things. Jesus, in His love, bore our sins on the cross. He, he bore all those things, all those sinful things. Amen. Not so that they could be swept under the rug, but so that they could be forgiven Amen. and we could have a relationship with Him. Love bears all things. Love is eager to believe the best about others. He, he, he states it in verse 7 that believes all things, but the way we think of the word believes, we think that just means that you're gullible, right? And, and that's not what He means. By the way, did you know that if you say the word gullible really, really slow, it sounds like the word orange. Try that out later, okay? But it, it's not about being gullible. It's about believing the best in others. You know who utterly failed at this? Job's friends. Remember God was testing Job? What, what had Job done wrong? Nothing. Job hadn't done anything wrong, had he? But God allowed Satan to attack Job and take basically everything he had away from him except for his life. And what was Job's friend's answer? Why, Job, why? You know you're suffering because there's sin in your life. Because God doesn't let bad things happen to people who are living right. Yeah, yeah. As, as, you know, that, that was... You know, I'm glad that, that, that Job is the oldest book in the Bible because people have been dealing with that for that long. That's right, brother. If I act right and I do right, surely God will bless me and I'll get all these blessings. No, God can test you even when you haven't done something wrong. And, and if you're a good Christian friend, you're going to try your best to believe the best about people. Amen. Love always hopes. Hope saw things. Love is always looking forward to the goodness of God's transforming grace. It doesn't take failure in our brothers and sisters as being final. It, it sees that God can move and work in somebody's life. And it takes that into account that God is able to change people. Think, think of this. Peter, on the night Jesus was betrayed, how many times did he betray Jesus? Three times. The last time he did it with cursing. And, and Jesus saw him. And, and when, when Jesus, when, when Peter found out that Jesus was raised from the dead, what was his reaction? I'm going fishing. Yep. Resurrection made him want to quit because he realized that he was a failure to Jesus. I might as well give up. I've denied the Lord three times and He's risen from the dead. What hope is there for me? But you remember what Jesus did? Yes. Met Him on the shore. Fed Him breakfast. Peter, do you love me? Amen. Feed Amen. my sheep. You see... Jesus wasn't ready to give up on Peter. And we shouldn't give up on people either. Shouldn't give up on our brothers and Amen, sisters. We, brother. we know that God can work and move in a mighty way. And then finally, love endures. The Bible tells us in John chapter 13 and verse 1 that now before the feast of Passover, Jesus knowing his hour had come that He would depart out of this world to the Father. Having loved His own who were in the world, He loved them to the end. Do you love people until the end? Do you hang in there? Or when somebody lets you down, do you just, well, they can't be a part of my life anymore. I'm done with them. Now, Jesus loves until the end. 
do you? <clears throat> you see, here, here's the thing, church. We can have all kinds of programs. We can have the latest technology. We can have, we can have this place full of people. If we don't have love for each other, we're just wasting time. That's right, brother. Amen. And I'd rather, let's take the people that we have here right now and let's learn to really love one another and grow from there. But do you know that all these things that I've read, all these characteristics in verse 4 through 7, that Jesus acts that way toward you. He's patient with you. He's kind to you. He, he's not willing to give up on you. He's not ready to do that. And, and if you'll come and surrender your life to Him, His, His love can invade your heart. And you can love people the way you ought to. You can't do this on your own. You have to have the Holy Spirit Amen. give you a new heart and work in you. This is not something you'll ever do just by pure effort. It's a fruit of the Spirit. Are you willing to surrender to Jesus today? So oh.